Okay, well, welcome. I see that folks are trickling in. Um, welcome to the last of, of our speaker series commemorating uh, the Utah State Historical Society at 125 years. Um, and so this uh, session is being recorded and um, we will, what we'll do is we'll have uh, Spencer Stewart and Eliza McKinney provide um, a, a presentation about their analysis, which they'll explain here in a moment. And then we'll have a, a group conversation about what that analysis means. Um, after, I think that we'll leave some time, this session is scheduled to go until 1.30 uh, p.m. And so it is an hour and a half long. We'll save some time for sure for audience comments and questions for the group. Um, and so just be sure that if you have questions, feel free to enter those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Holly George, for introductions. Great, thank you, Jed. Um, we are very excited at, to for this session. Um, and I, I think it's one that can inform a lot of what, what we do at the quarterly. Um, our, our participants today are um, Susan Rue, Emeritus Professor of History at BYU, Spencer Stewart of the University of Chicago, um, Eliza McKinney, graduate student at the University of Utah, Gary Topping of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Salt Lake City, and um, Jedediah Rogers, Utah Historical Quarterly, and myself, Holly George, Utah Historical Quarterly. Um, and I'm going to turn the time now to Spencer for presentation, and then we will um, again have moderated discussion afterward. Thanks. I need to unmute myself. Okay, does that everyone can see that? <laughs> um, all right, yeah. Um, Again, thanks to uh, Holly and Jed for uh, inviting Liza and I to present today. Um, and we're grateful, of course, to Gary and Susan for joining the panel as well. Um, excited for this productive discussion. Um, so this, this project that I'm presenting on, uh, it evolved out of a digital history course that uh, I taught during the spring uh, semester at the University of Utah. Um, so uh, in teaching a sort of methods course, I wanted a lot of the methods that we uh, learned to kind of uh, build on one another. And to do that, I decided to pick a single corpus of text, a, a, a single database. And for that database, just so happened that the Utah Historical Quarterly was a a uh, rich source that was available uh, for me and teaching a history course at Utah, it was seemed like a very um, fitting data set. Um, and so I'm grateful that Eliza can be here to present with me and um, we'd like to, of course, acknowledge the contributions of the other students, Seth and Dakota, for their for their uh, work on, on this project as well. So I would like to preface our conversation a little bit by saying a few things about methodology. Uh, a lot of what historians do and a lot of our historical research um, relies on the close reading of diaries, letters, and, and other primary sources. Our, present today, our presentation today adopts a somewhat different method, and that's a method that has become popular in recent years and is known as distant reading. Distant reading is essentially a computational approach to extracting broad uh, generalizations about historical materials. Distant reading has many different forms. Uh, think of like a, a word cloud that we have here. This is a word cloud of the most common words that have appeared in the pages of the Utah Historical Quarterly. So we get words that pop out like Utah and Salt Lake, Mormon, Indian, time, people. Um, this is one way of distantly reading a text. Another approach might be maps. Um, 
here is a map of the Century of Black Mormons project and the all the birthplaces of the individuals in the database. This is another way of of sort of distantly reading a data set, a different approach. Our argument here isn't to say that close reading is somehow better than, or that distant reading is somehow better than close reading, um, but rather to say that distant reading can provide alternative ways of exploring a data set. Um, and with that, we'd like to introduce the data set that we work with and turn the time over to Eliza. <laughs> Um, so we decided to look specifically at the text of the Utah Historical Quarterly. How we did that was by scraping all of that data from Issue, which is the platform that UHQ uses to host all of the back issues. So that ends up covering a time period from 1928 to 2021. Uh, we did not include book reviews for various reasons, partly because there's not clear authorship and subject, partly because of our methodology, it created a lot of hiccups. Um, so we just focused on research articles and primary source documents like letters and diaries that UHQ uh, periodically publishes. That ended up being 1,433 articles uh, with 839 unique authors and a total word count of 8 million words. So quite a bit. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, Spencer. Um, part of how we were able to analyze all of this text was by separating it into categories using something called optical character recognition or OCR. Um, this way we don't have to individually go through and, and figure out which is the title, which is the author. All of that is done uh, through a computer system. Um, but we did separate the text out into article titles, author name, um, the author metadata, so some of the uh, biographical information about them, the year, volume, issue number, page range, so we could see how long articles were, and then we had the text itself and the text length. Um, and the next slide. And this is just looking at that length of text over time. Uh, it was something that we found interesting. Um, and this is, again, excluding book reviews. But uh, we can see that there's been an increase in the, in the length of the journal over time. Um, it remained relatively stable from the 1960s to the 2000s at about 100,000 words. But then we see this huge increase in around 2016 to the present to around 150,000 words per issue. So quite a jump. So um, one way to kind of begin our analysis might be to provide a, a brief overview of the quarterly and its relationship to the overlapping fields of Western and Mormon history. Um, the Utah State Historical Society began publishing the quarterly in 1928. Um, as Jed Rogers has outlined, the quarterly emerged out of a society where Utahns, mostly white Mormons, proud of their heritage, sought to commemorate their past. Early years of the journal reflected general trends in Mormon historiography. So we see a lot of like the publication and emphasis on primary sources. Um, we also see occasionally the perpetuation of this sort of pioneer myth, master narrative. By the mid-century, however, Utah Historical Quarterly was undergoing kind of a, 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 um, a sort of professionalization was taking place. Um, this is where we get uh, Utah Historical Quarterly in some ways is at the forefront of the growing fields of Western history and Mormon studies. So in the early 1940s, the quarterly was began to be elevated by figures such as Dale Morgan, um, Russ Mortensen, and others. Um, Gary Topping's excellent book isn't about Utah Historical Quarterly specifically, but a lot of the authors he highlights were um, frequently published in the quarterly um, and are a part of this kind of general transformation. Uh, this correlates with some trends that are taking place within academia more broadly. So in 1961, the Western Historical Association was established, and in 1970, they began publishing the Western Historical Quarterly. Uh, the 
WHQ was first edited by Leonard Arrington, which as we find looking through our database, Arrington was the, at that point was one of the most active publishers in the Utah Historical Quarterly. And um, yeah, by 1970, he had published over two dozen, around two dozen articles in UHQ. And um, as of today, he's the most frequently uh, published author in UHQ history. Um, Arrington's ties to UHQ also speak in, in part to uh, the quarterly's relationship to the growing field of, of Mormon history as well. Uh, we could set aside debates about, you know, the origins of New Mormon history or whether or not it's really new. Um, but it's important to note, I think it's worth noting that UHQ was publishing many of the scholars who would become associated with this, this form of scholarship. Figures such as Dale Morgan, Juanita Brooks, Leonard Arrington, and others. Uh, these figures would go on to establish, uh, many of these figures would go on to help establish the Mormon Historical Association and the Journal of Mormon History. Now we can explore this history and the, the relationship between UHQ and these other two journals um, a little bit differently as well. We could, again, looking at um, data for who is published in Utah Historical Quarterly and Western Historical Quarterly uh, since the 1970s. We find that there are 65 scholars who have published in both of these uh, venues, they, and they've published a, uh, a total of 281 different articles in the two venues. Now, if we look at WHQ and UHQ, the general trend tends to be that scholars are publishing a lot in one venue much more than the other. It's relatively rare um, to find any scholars who are publishing more than one or two articles in both um, of these two uh, journals. On the other hand, if we look at um, the Journal of Mormon History and Utah Historical Quarterly, there's a much, uh, there tends to be a much stronger connection. Um, and we find 118 scholars who have published in both 819 articles between the two journals. Um, and here we find it much more common for scholars to be publishing regular in regularly in both venues. Um, now, another way to get at um, UHQ's position within the broader intellectual community is to look at citation data. Um, Looking at citation data also highlights kind of UHQ's broader impact that it's having. Um, to do this, we scrape data from Google Scholar. Um, Google Scholar in some ways tends to be biased towards more recent publications. So we do see a trend where uh, citations of UHQ articles are increasing over time. Um, this could be partly related to um, just the data set itself, um, or it could be due to greater visibility of the quarterly. But collectively, we find that UHQ articles have been cited 1,000, at least 1,267 times. We can break this citation data up into, uh, you know, what types of sources are citing the quarterly. Um, journal articles make up about half. Uh, theses and dissertations make up about a quarter, and the books and books make up the other quarter. Um, Uh, the other, the, the 1% other is a, a variety of different sources. So it includes like court cases. Um, what are some others? <laughs> I'm forgetting right now. Um, court cases, websites, um, speeches, um, government and environmental reports as well. So those tend to be a, a relatively small amount, but, but they are there. Um, yeah, theses and dissertations citing Utah Historical Quarterly most frequently come from institutions in Utah. So um, students at Brigham Young University, University of Utah, and Utah State are at the top. Um, but we find that students working beyond that, um, students working at around 80 different institutions across North America, Europe, and Asia have cited Utah Historical Quarterly in their theses and dissertations. So the reach is quite broad. Um, books, 
We find that there are about 100 different book publishers that have published books that cite the quarterly. Um, so the reach is also quite broad. And if we look at journal articles, the um, UHQ has been cited by over 150 different academic journals. Um, these journals range from history uh, to folklore studies, anthropology, law, marketing, environmental science, biology, genetics, um, epidemiology, and, and more. Many of these journals are UHQ is only cited once, um, once or twice. Uh, but we do find that this, this um, range is quite broad. Now, the most frequent articles, the most frequent journals to cite um, UHQ tend to be those that are associated with Mormon and Western history still. So at the top of the list, we find um, journals in the field of Mormon studies. We get the Journal of Mormon History. We have Dialogue, BYU Studies. Um, and below that, we do find some Western history journals, such as Pacific Historical Review and the Western Historical Quarterly. But I think it is worth emphasizing here that Mormon studies, Mormon history related journals are about five to six times more likely to cite UHQ than um, the Western history journals. So um, it there definitely is kind of a pull more towards kind of the, the Mormon uh, studies side of things. Um, so uh, this goes into the subject of UHQ and when and who is being uh, written about in Utah history. And in order to get to uh, the answers to these questions, we use something called named entity recognition. Uh, this is a tool that will look for patterns in the text so that we don't have to go individually through. Um, as you can see in this image, text is divided based on these patterns into time, date, uh, unique person names, so that we can then uh, categorize those and put them in their own category to analyze. Um, for the date, that ended up being a little tricky, but we were able to get the years that are written about in UHQ um, by by extracting the year from those longer dates that you see at the top of the text. And to get to uh, unique person names, that also had uh, its own struggles. A computer looks at something like Fish Lake and sees that as a person name. Uh, so we had to do quite a bit of cleaning up with that. We also decided not to worry about people who are only mentioned once in the entire history of the journal because there were just too many names uh, to keep track of. So that ended up cutting, I think, a little over 8,000 names. Um, and that left us with a list of 6,200 uh, people's names who have appeared at least twice in the journal and uh, 58,000 time references. So we had to narrow that down quite a bit as well. Um, to look more specifically at the people in the journal that are written about, we use something called a gender prediction package. Uh, this is a tool that will predict the gender of a person's uh, name based on census data of uh, the, um, the uh, it, it takes the data to see what are the most common names for men or women. Um, of course, this is still working in a gender binary. It doesn't account for individual authors' own um, gender identity. It's only using the name. So there are some limitations with that. Um, the next slide. So the first question is, when is Utah history? Based on the articles in the journal, uh, when are the most his, uh, significant historical events taking place? Um, as you can see by this graph, the, the biggest clump of, of history that's happening in the journal is after 1847 and a little bit after that. So we're mostly looking at um, probably Mormon pioneer history. Um, of course, this has changed over time. Uh, in the early days of the journal, there was this much greater emphasis on pioneer history that has changed, but there still is a pretty big disparity between other time periods, especially before 1800. Uh, you can see that there's not 
uh, very many articles that are addressing that time period. And then we see this blip that's 1776. So it still is looking at an Anglo-American perspective um, and not looking at the, the longer history of Utah. Um, do you wanna go to the next slide? And now we're looking at who is Utah history according to who is written about the journal. Uh, we saw a, a huge disparity between uh, gender and, and this emphasis on Mormon male leadership. Uh, Brigham Young is the most cited in the journal by far. Um, he appears at least once in over half of all of the articles in, in the Utah Historical Quarterly. Um, after him, you can see that it's Joseph Smith, who's a Mormon leader who never lived in Utah. Um, so, so we're still seeing this big emphasis on that history. Um, of the, the most cited people in the journal, the ones who appear in the most articles, um, the first woman who appears on that list is Eliza R. Snow in 23rd place. So that means that there are 22 men who are spoken about more than she is. Um, do you wanna go to the next slide? And, and this looks at this gender disparity over time. Um, so while there are some prominent women who are discussed in the journal, like Eliza R. Snow, Emmeline Bells, uh, Susie Young Gates is, is uh, written about frequently, we're still seeing this huge disparity over um, men and women written about in the journal. Um, of the 6,000 historical figures that we tracked, only 15% of those were women. Uh, this chart is looking at this changes over time. So at the bottom, we have the years of the journal. Um, men are represented by the black bar, women by the white. And, and you can see that there has been um, a little bit more gender parity as time goes on. Um, it goes down to about 80% male, 20% female around 1980. But there's not a huge difference except for a few blips in issues uh, where that changes. So for the past 40 years, gender parity within the journal has relatively stayed the same, uh, about 75% male. Thinking beyond uh, gender, we can look at how other groups are represented in the pages of Utah Historical Quarterly. Getting at this is a little bit trickier um, than uh, studying it at scale is a little bit different, trickier than, than with gender. Um, but um, Utah, the Utah State Historical Society does have this lively tradition of, of um, writing about Utah's diverse past. One of the most Probably still the most notable example is Helen Papa Nicholas's The Peoples of Utah, published in 1976. More recently, Sanford Layton has compiled a series of Utah historical quarterly articles um, about Utah's minorities in a volume titled Being Different. But how has this kind of representation changed over time? Uh, trying to get at this, again, is a bit more difficult than gender, but um, so our approach is a little bit more uh, crude and straightforward. Basically, what we did was we created groups of indigenous and minority groups, um, kind of these broad categories, and within them identified some keywords that account for change over time as well that would, uh, that would be associated with these groups. Um, this isn't a perfect way of getting at this, but it's just it's one way that we can kind of broadly trace this over time. And many of these groups are quite big and broad. Um, our indigenous group is really big and uh, future research of course could narrow these categories much more and get at um, specific groups within, within these larger groups as well. Um, but this is how, this is how we, we um, started. If we map kind of the, these different groups over time, what we what we find is that coverage of these groups over time. Here we're looking at decade and the frequency with 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 which these different terms were mentioned within the pages of the quarterly. 
what we find is that the indigenous group has been um, best, by far is the best represented of these six groups. Um, so the blue line here is, is looking at frequency with which the keywords in our indigenous group occurred in the quarterly over time. And the orange um, is the sum total of all the other groups combined. If we look at the other five groups specifically, we find that there's a lot of fluctuation over time. Um, the Greek community received a lot of attention in 1970 with Helen Papa Nicholas's work, this is a special issue. Um, and then we also see that in the 1990s and 2000s that the East Asian community, the Chinese, especially the Japanese and Chinese communities have received additional attention and representation. And then if we look at just the last two years of publication, the, two, the 2020 so far, so um, 2020 and 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021, um, the Black and African American community has been um, better represented in the past two years. We find generally that the uh, Black community has been um, neglected and underrepresented until until about the last year, couple of years. Um, now, of course, how does this compare to, what is kind of our baseline to understand this coverage? And one way to get at this baseline is again, to just look at coverage of Brigham Young, um, who is a bit of an anomaly, but um, still one way to understand how these communities have been represented, represented compared to other histories. And the brown line here is references to Brigham Young, and we basically find that there are only two decades in which references to one of these communities has surpassed um, references to Brigham Young. Um, uh, so how are we to kind of understand what's going on here? What factors are contributing to these sorts of histories that are being told? Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of these factors and We'll start with archives. Yeah, so uh, we thought about looking at the primary sources of these articles to see where they are getting this history from. Um, it didn't make a lot of sense to look at the whole history of the journal, uh, so we decided to focus on just the past 100 research articles that were written, which only takes us back to about 2016. So all of these are are very recent. Um, I do want to mention now because it will come up later in this research that about two thirds of these articles or 66 percent uh, were centered on the experiences of white men as the subject. Um, 18 were about white women and only 16 were about black indigenous or other marginalized groups. Um, so first just looking at all of these articles together about uh, what what archives they're using, uh, we found that there were four main archives that were used the most uh, in the journal. That was the Church History Library at the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, the Marriott Library at the University of Utah, the Utah State Historical so Society, and the Harold B. Lee Library at Brigham Young University. Um, of those archives, the Church History Library was the most cited, um, and that came in at Seven percent, um, and I do want to mention that these articles could cite multiple archives, so these numbers don't add up to one hundred percent, right? Because one article might have used both the Church History Library and the Marriott Library, and some articles didn't use any of these at all. Um, but of these, we do see uh, that the Church History Library is the most cited. Um, the Marriott Library is a close second at twenty-six percent. Um, the Utah State Historical Society came in at 22% of, of these 100 articles that cited it, and then the Harold B. Lee Library was used in 19% uh, of the articles. And, uh, but that changes a little bit when we look at marginalized people in the archives. Um, so this is just looking at 
those articles that spoke specifically about marginalized groups um, for these numbers that includes white women as well and then um, these racial and ethnic minority groups that we um, cited earlier and of those the marriott library is uh, by far the most cited um, in almost half of the articles it comes in at about 46 percent of these articles cited the Marriott Library Archive. Um, after that is the Utah State Historical Society at about 37%. Uh, the Church History Library is at 30% and Harold B. Lee is at 26%. Uh, so according to these numbers, it, it seems to show that people are either finding more information about marginalized people in the Marriott Library than they are in these other archives or uh, though, or, or people assume that they can find the information there, so that historians are choosing to go to the Marriott Library rather than the Church History Library or any of these other archives, uh, because they believe that, that they will find records of those people there. Um, in this issue that we talked about earlier, uh, issue 88 in 2020, that was mostly about the black community in Utah. Uh, I put that up here because every single one of the articles in, in that journal, um, in that issue, all use the Marriott Library Archive. So we definitely see that um, that's where a lot of these authors are getting, getting their sources for these stories. And then we looked at the sources themselves and we found uh, a couple different things. I'm just going to highlight a few of them to um, help get us a sense of this. Uh, one of the most cited primary sources used by uh, recent authors were diaries. Uh, they were used in 33 of the articles. Um, within those 33, 69% were articles about white men. 21% uh, were about white women and 9% were about marginalized people. Um, these numbers pretty closely follow the overall uh, demographic of this body of work. Um, and I do want to note that that doesn't necessarily mean that it was a white man's diary or journal that was being used. Uh, they, it could be any kind of diary. It was just a diary used in an article about white men. Um, but only 33 of the articles used diaries. Um, most of them were still about white men, uh, which sort of uh, helps us examine what diaries are kept in archives, uh, what, what diaries feel important for archives to preserve, what kind of people feel that they should be keeping a personal record. Um, and so this sort of plays into how identity affects both the preservation of primary sources, but also the creation of primary sources. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? Uh, more commonly used were letters and correspondence. Um, there were about 53 articles, so over half that used letters as primary sources. Um, and then we do see some differences in the numbers here. 66% uh, were still about white men, but we see this huge increase in uh, racial and ethnic minorities uh, at 17%, which is quite a jump from diaries. Um, white women were used 17% as well. Um, so we see a little bit more representation of both of those. And part of that might have to do with uh, who writes letters as opposed to diaries. Uh, and also who keeps correspondence, um, that, that those uh, relationships might feel more important to marginalized groups, um, but they also might be something that you preserve sentimentally that then becomes a great historical record. Um, I included Ruby Nelson on the side here uh, as a good example of how this works in the archive. Um, her letters are found in the Uinta County uh, Regional History Center. And she was a very prolific letter writer. Uh, in 1979, she was 85 years old, and she wrote 247 letters. And, and those are all preserved uh, in the archive there. So, so that really helps us get more to these stories if we have that as a source base uh, for people who um, might not have the same kind of professional papers that you see in archives. <clears throat> 
And, and the last uh, primary source I'm going to talk about are oral histories. Uh, we have a lot of really great oral history collections in the state, and we saw them being used in quite a few of the articles as well. Um, oral histories can also be helpful uh, in getting the histories of people who don't know how to read or write or um, who, who aren't showing up in other documentation like government documents or legal documents. Um, and for those who we don't necessarily see as historically significant. So I was hoping to see more uh, representation of uh, marginalized people and of white women in these numbers. And, and we do see a little as much as I expected. Um, for those who used already archived oral history collections in their uh, articles, 61% were about white men. Um, 28% were about marginalized people, so that's quite a jump, uh, and only 9% were about white women. In uh, oral histories that were conducted by the author of the article themselves, uh, so, you know, chose to go out and interview someone, 67% uh, were about white men. Again, we see a pretty high number in 25% about marginalized people, but only 7% about white women. Uh, so according to these numbers, it seems like to um, get to the stories of marginalized people, oral history is a really great way to do that. And we see a lot more representation in those numbers. Um, do you wanna go to the next slide? But it is surprising that there is this huge drop in numbers among women, um, especially because we have a lot of really great oral history collections throughout the state. Uh, one of those is the Eileen H. Clyde 20th Century Women's Legacy Archive. You can see uh, Miss Clyde on the side there uh, that looks at women in politics in Utah. Um, up at Utah State, there's the Beyond Suffrage, a century of Northern Utah women making history. And then the Daughters of Utah Pioneers Oral History Project at BYU all have really robust collections. Uh, these collections have been cited in a lot of books that have come out recently and a lot of award-winning books, but we don't see them hugely represented in the, um, in the articles in Utah Historical Quarterly, which was surprising. Yeah, so outside of archival holdings to just kind of I guess this is our way of somebody's wrapping up this presentation. Um, our final factor we'll look at is authorship. Um, it's perhaps the fact that authorship um, impacts what gets written about is perhaps so obvious that it doesn't necessitate any further analysis. But we're gonna we're gonna do it anyway because because we can. Um, and through this, we'll again approach it through the lens of of gender. Although uh, what we find for gender could could likely we'd probably likely see similar trends for for other groups as well, underrepresented groups. Throughout much of Utah Historical Quarterly, there has been a gender disparity when it comes to authorship. Um, this is probably a trend. This is a trend that reflects the larger field of history, so it's not unique in any by any means to to UHQ. Several prominent women have published frequently in the quarter, quarterly over the years. Um, got Helen Papa Nicholas, we've mentioned already, Juanita Brooks, Miriam Murphy, Jesse Embry. But overall, women only comprise roughly one fourth of all the authors who have published in the quarterly. Uh, this representation has also varied quite a bit over time. So here we have a graph of the percentage of men and women authors by year. Um, the, find the year at the bottom and then the percentage on, on the left side. Um, there are a couple years that are notable to point out that are kind of exceptions. And typically these years where we see a, a greater representation of women authors all are correlated to special issues in the quarterly. So in 1970, we have this issue on women in Utah. We also have Helen Papa Nicholas's uh, special issue on the Greek community that year. In 1980, we have a issue on growing up in Utah where a number of the authors were, were women as well. And then in 2020, we had the celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, so we see that there. This gender gap is important 
for a number of reasons. Uh, but one of these is that there is a strong correlation between women authorship and references to women historical figures. So if we look at articles that have been published just since 1970, um, articles in which the authors are all men, um, they only reference women historical figures around 8% of the time. So this graph is showing articles since 1970 that are authored by men and what percentage of historical figures they're referring to are men versus women. Um, so again, we see maybe some change, but no clear, clear trends. Now, if we look at the same graph, but for women authors, um, the picture is quite differently. Here we find that roughly one in every four referenced historical figures will be a woman, a, a woman when, when at least one of the authors of an article is a woman for in cases where there's multiple authorship. Um, authorship clearly matters when it comes to the types of stories that we want to tell and who will be included in those stories. Again, you can see the difference there between those two. My guess is that we'd likely find similar trends when it comes to other minority groups, but um, we didn't have the time to do that for this presentation. Uh, so to kind of wrap up, um, I think it goes without saying that there's a lot to celebrate about the history of Utah Historical Quarterly, and our intent here isn't to discredit the excellent work of the Quarterly or the Society. Um, we're especially excited about this kind of ongoing upcoming project the Peoples of Utah Revisited. Um, I think that our intent instead was uh, rather to highlight some of these broad trends that we see in uh, the Utah Historical Quarterly um, and to highlight factors such as archives and authorship that have likely shaped those trends. Um, those familiar with Utah history and historiography, those on the panel probably won't be too surprised by our findings, but we hope that this sort of distant reading approach serves as a constructive uh, conversation starter for the rest of this afternoon. So we look forward to the discussion and thank you. Eliza and Spencer, thank you so much. Um, this is <laughs> reading your 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 work has been um, it's been on my mind constantly, and I really thank you for it. Let's go now to get reactions from the panel. Um, let's start with Susan, then Gary, Jed, and myself, and then we'll open for questions. And then, then we'll do our questions and also get audience ones if we want. Um, so, Susan, please. Well, I just want to praise this work of distant history. I think it adds a whole new dimension to the way we look at the quarterly. And um, I think it's a useful way for looking at a state history journal. Uh, that's the only suggestion I would have is how does this compare to say, Annals of Iowa? Do they similarly have half their articles on the pioneer period? Uh, I think that would be really uh, helpful for somebody to do if there are, maybe there are articles already existing that you could find and and cite. I'm not suggesting you analyze the annals of Iowa as interesting as that would as that would be. I think it shows that we have some challenges here uh, for us as historians and for the Utah State Historical Society and Utah Historical Quarterly. One question I have as I read through this that maybe we'll <clears throat> talk more about is is why uh, I've been thinking about supporting institutions such as the Red Center, the Center for the American West, uh, and then we might see those as supporting Western history. But then on, uh, if we see on the other side, those who are supporting uh, LDS history or Mormon history, Mormon studies, you have the DUP, you have the Church History Library. And what is what does the presence of those kinds of institutions do uh, do they help uh, gin up or get more history going in those fields? Uh, it seems at first rush that we just have so much, so many local institutions on the on the Mormon side of history, Mormon studies side, that I that I wonder. And then one other factor: uh, BYU ended its graduate program in the late 1990s. Uh, I think that has had an impact on on the use of its of the Lee collections on the questions that have been asked. 
And so some of those uh, Utah Historical Quarterly left here, uh, I, I don't know exact the exact year, the Western Historical Quarterly decamped to, to, I, to Oklahoma. So there are those kinds of things that might be helpful to think about why, uh, why we see what we see. Gary, please. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, um, I'm very grateful to have all this research. Um, however, I would, uh, would echo what uh, Spencer said, that uh, uh, very little of it actually surprises me. In fact, as, as I was listening to the wonderful presentation, I almost thought that I could have written this presentation without any computer aids at all, you know? So some of the stuff is just kind of obvious. So they point out that uh, the bulk of Utah historical writing kind of emphasizes the period after the arrival of the Mormon pioneers. Well, duh, of course, uh, that, that's when the sources began to proliferate. So historians go where the sources are, you know, so of course that has been the case. Um, the, the idea that, uh, that uh, women and minorities are still uh, lagging in their coverage uh, does not surprise me at all. Uh, Utah, uh, Utah society has been largely a patriarchal society, and so I would expect that to, to be the case. Uh, their findings do indicate that I think in some ways we've made significant progress. Uh, the Peoples of Utah book being the, just the watershed, in my opinion, in 1976 of Utah history for the first time, we're giving really concentrated effort toward understanding uh, minorities and uh, that kind of thing. Um, let's see, what else? Um, uh, well, uh, they, uh, their findings indicate that uh, uh, Western history and Utah history has largely, uh, for, for many years, been kind of mired in the 19th century. And once again, duh, I mean, I think I learned that about, about the first history course I signed up for in college, that we have this fixation on the 19th century. And I suppose we're going to talk about that. I noticed one of the questions that Holly had uh, prepared for us is uh, the relationship of Utah history to Western history. And uh, that has begun to change as, as the graphs show uh, that since about the late 1980s, we begin moving into the 20th century more uh, frequently. And that I would attribute to the rise of the so-called new Western history in the late 1980s. Uh, the new Western history, among other things, encouraged us to look at the West as a place rather than as a frontier. So that once the frontier phase has passed, however you might want to define that, uh, history keeps on going. And so, uh, so the West is a place just like New England or the South is a place, and we can write that history on up into the 20th century. Um, finally, um, I'd like to uh, address this issue of women in, in Utah history. Um, there are two things that women have women historians have written about women and male historians have written about men once again duh i would kind of expect that you know it, it's deplorable uh, i myself have written about women on a number of occasions and have been very happy to do that but uh, uh and, and there are other men who have done that as well um but uh, um so uh why is it then that, and I think one of Holly's questions addressed this also, why are there fewer women in the historical profession than men? And I frankly don't know the answer to that. Uh, I've, I've been involved in various academic history departments for many years, either as a student or as a faculty member, and I've never seen a sign in a history department saying no women need apply. I mean, it seems, and we've got two very distinguished women historians on our panel here today, I should say three, I'm sorry, I didn't want to exclude you, Eliza, uh, that uh, obviously got into the field of history and excelled at it. So I don't know, maybe there's just a kind of a larger cultural prejudice that the women major in English and the guys major in history or something like that. Uh, there are just things like that. Right? We don't have very many women diesel mechanics either. And maybe that's part of the same kind of cultural bias, but uh, it's just something, I don't know whether to be agitated about that or not. Uh, 
it just kind of is what it is. Uh, I don't know that I want to see more women historians any more than I want to see more male historians. I want to see more good historians uh, from uh, from both uh, uh, genres, uh, genders. I mean, so so those are kind of my random uh, rambling thoughts. Yeah, well, I mean, I would just say this is such a welcome study, and Spencer and Eliza, I'm so appreciative of the two of you for for taking this on and sharing it with us. I wanted to just make a, um, three, maybe two quick notes here at the outset. One is the rela relationship between UHQ and Utah history. I mean, so of course the, the body of Utah history is wide and deep, right? It's found in historical memorials, performances, commemorations, policy documents, legislative reports, museums, magazines. So even among traditional scholarly products, UHQ is not alone, but I think that there is some merit in using this study and equating, say, UHQ with the larger field of Utah history, as, as UHQ really is the, it's the official state journal, and the data set here spans nearly a century. So the eight, 8 million total words, um, that excludes book reviews, I think that tells us more than just about the content and authorship of UHQ. I think it reveals sort of the, some contours of Utah history in illuminating ways, and we can talk about those if you want. But I also think that the citation data shows UHQ is foundational to other works of Utah history. And so I think that we can, from this data set, I'd be curious to know if there's pushback here. I think that from this data set, we can make some fairly broad conclusions about Utah history. Um, uh, one interesting point that hasn't been mentioned by Susan and Gary is that the data did find a 30 year lag from the time of publication to the appearance of the journals and citations. And I suppose that reflects the long shelf life of scholarship um, and of UHQ, the long term value of the journal. I also suspect that the lag is due in part from the relative isolation that UHQ has, has been over, has had over the years. The journal did not appear on any kind of national platform until we published our full catalog on JSTOR around um, 2018. And so I see the increasing accessibility and visibility of UHQ um, to sort of lessen that lag of 30 years considerably. Um, I, th I think my last point would be it's somewhat hard to tell how impressive um, the reach of the journal is. Um, to Susan's point, without looking at maybe seeing similar da data for other state and regional journals. But I am struck at just how many different journals cite to UHQ. And I think this reflects the journal's you know, longevity and reputation as a place to find Utah history. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind my reaction, um... My my immediate reaction was kind of a well duh yeah <laughs> this is it's obvious that there's this this focus on white male leaders. Um, my second thing actually made me my first first reaction was something that I hope is not apologia or defensive, but just like I I am I've been so proud of the past editors of the quarterly the whole time I've been here, and honestly of what what Jed and I have done. Um, I think a lot of like Kent. Kent and Craig, Kent Powell and Craig Fuller's work on on labor and ethnic history, um, the the women's history that I think Marion Murphy was championing in the 80s, and um, then a handful of the articles we've published, I'm I'm really proud of, um, for the sake of women's history. There's one on rape law, Michaela Smith in 2017 that um, is really uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons I I'm behind that article. <laughs> um and you know it, it's we we compiled a bibliography in 2020 of women's history in in the quarterly and some of that history is you know more sophisticated more more um analytical than others but it's all it's all a documentation of the life of women and, and also girls um in utah and and has obvious you know utility and value um, but it's it's just a portion of what needs to be written. And so that gets to my third reaction um, of, of the distant reading. And that's how how do we integrate? And this is 
this is a big question. How do we integrate women and minority groups into Utah history in, in ways that are sophisticated and so that they're understood as, as legitimately part of the framework, not just tokens? And that's um and 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 then second, how can that be done in a way that honors past historiography? And you know, I think I think let's start with that as a question. How do we how do we integrate people into the broader story and still like, you know, like Brigham Young's obviously important. <laughs> so so how do we tell this story in um I guess a broader and more sophisticated way. So I'll open that up to y'all. Well, I think one one way to uh, broaden the story is to increase what's in your pipeline. And these articles, I don't know if they all just come over the transom or how you develop them, or if we could figure out where are they coming from. How much are they influenced by graduate programs? How much are they influenced by what we would call amateur historians? Um, and I think this article does us a favor by pointing to the usage of sources. And I've been working for some time on a final chapter for a Utah history textbook. And I have to say, it's been very hard for me to find sources on Pacific Islander history, except for Yosepa. It's been very hard for me to find sources on Latinx history. Uh, so maybe there are sources that I'm not aware of, and maybe there are sources people are not aware of. And this this could be something that you could make a, a regular column in the Utah Historical Quarterly, focus on a source. You could have source workshops that were maybe partnered with a library. Um, I think they've done us a favor by showing us that there are sources that that, that aren't being used, uh, like the oral history sources. And once you have more of that source material available, then I, I think it changes the conversation. Um, I also think there are probably women's diaries and letters that are sitting in people's basements. <laughs> that have not been donated for public use. Uh, maybe women's diaries and letters are not valued as much as we point out in the case of the woman in, in Uinta. Um, that's, I think, a, a factor. That There's been a lot of work on suffrage. I, I think you're right. We don't want them in there as tokens, but there are key, key issues and junctures of time where women's history and women's voices, and I, and I would just add men's history, Oh, well, let's start thinking about it as gender history. What have we had some history of, say, coal miners, the culture of, of the coal mines or something like that? That would be also be useful. Well, Susan, may I add, when when we've like gone on the road or talked about the New Peoples of Utah project, I've, I've specifically used um, Pacific Islander and Latinx history as the we don't have enough. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay, we've got a question, but also uh, other other panelists wanting to talk about or answer this. Well, Jeff. I'll just piggyback real fast on what Susan said about source material, which I think is central to this conversation. So, published scholarship and archives, they go hand in hand, and I, and what what appears in the archive is is going to appear in published sources. I also think that we need to talk about, and I don't know if an analysis can be done on non-archival sources and the general accessibility and the move towards accessibility of those kinds of um, source material. I mean, clearly researchers need to scrutinize every type of source, especially those found online, you know, every document in the archive as well. But having more sources available, I think, will broaden how we understand Utah history. And I suspect, as Susan, you mentioned, there is a lot of material that's it's just not being tapped. It's maybe in someone's house. So scanning projects that some of my colleagues have begun to do, scanning materials, um, and so they can get those into the arc into the collection and out to the public eye is important. And I've noticed too that oral histories, a lot of oral history work is being done, a lot of it through our organization. Um, but unfortunately, not a lot of this material is has been digitized or is other otherwise easily accessible to the public. So yeah, just to, that's my note on source material, how important it is. Mm 
Um, you know, one question I had as, as I was going through Spencer's work and thinking about the UHQ is like how much authors are using it. I know I use the um, Utah Digital Newspapers and, you know, there are all sorts of problems with using newspapers, but they're also a good source. So how would that affect um, understanding of, of different groups in Utah? If y'all have any any perspective on that, well, I have a question about that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, small newspapers that were published by different ethnic and minority groups. Are those also included in that? I haven't I haven't tried to find them. And is there a way? I think the broad access. Out? Yeah. Yeah, Eliza did a lot of the newspaper stuff. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Eliza. Yeah, yeah, we didn't include it because it wasn't, it was another well duh kind of thing that, you know, the most cited newspapers are the Tribune and the, the Daily Herald. Um, but it is also, um, it's an issue of citation too, to track what archives people are using. Uh, that not a lot of people are listing a digital archive when they cite it. So if people are using something like newspapers.com, which I, I can say as a grad student, I think everybody is using that in every paper they write, um, you're not going to cite newspapers.com. Uh, you're just going to cite the, the newspaper itself. So, so it's a little harder for us to track with this method um, to see see where people are getting newspaper sources from. Um, but there there was quite a bit of these smaller newspapers used. It just wasn't as much as as the Tribune or or the Daily Herald. You know, Greg Waltz, who knows a lot, <laughs> is um, he's saying, you know, there's been a huge jump in coverage with the Salt Lake Tribune. In, in digital newspapers, of course, because the the um, the collections increase there online. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, one question that I guess, well, you know, what? I'll ask this one right now. Um, if if you all were teaching a, a methodology course to students at a Utah university, it's pretty narrow. <laughs> um, how how would you use Spencer and Eliza's work to shape the course? Well, I think it's a great example of what of what can be done. It's an example of the possibilities and and it's an example of the limits. It's it's not the the complete answer, right? Uh, I know when I was in graduate school, we were each assigned to take a journal and kind of do something like this and count and analyze it and look at it at its history and i think a lot a lot can be discovered that way i i'd still like to know well what's what's the influence of social history on the utah historical quarterly uh do we have less military history than we used to because that as a american historiographical field has declined over time although I, I think with all those articles in the utah war we probably have not declined in in number but you know what's the impact of these broader historiographical trends on what appears in the Utah Historical Quarterly? Is it isolated, does it stand alone, or is it influenced by these? So I think it's a great example. Any other comments on that question? You know, I, I can't speak to the creating a course, but just in terms of the usefulness here. I think all of us in this call have done historiographical analyses, right? Um, on a particular uh, survey of a particular field or subject. And I and I think that um, what we see here in the distant reading analysis is that we, we can use this hard data that Spencer and Eliza have compiled and really hone in and focus our, some of our um, con more impressionistic conclusions that, that maybe we formed through doing a a more subjective reading of, of the literature um, and sort of not looking at the hard data per se. And, uh, you know, I see a number of areas where maybe notions that I've had, I've um, 
I've, I've had the notion that UHQ at different points in its history has held almost a kind of a counter Mormon history identity, um, prided itself in sort of being the place where you go if you're not doing Mormon history, um, and one that privileges Utah history that is not Mormon history. Um, and I think that from Spencer's analysis, we can, I, I see that that's not really the case, although it, it might shift from one side or the other. If you're doing Utah history, UHQ is where you might go to publish. I probably don't have a ton of maybe other options. I, I might be wrong about that on the local level. But if you're doing Mormon history, for example, you have UHQ, but you also have Dialogue and Sunstone and Journal of Mormon History. So I just think that, um, so anyway, that that's one area I've always, I've always seen UHQ as having a special place because it's a place where you can publish history that is not just Mormon, right? That we have an outlet for that so everybody's, everybody's represented. Susan? I think I think that's a that's a really good point. I I I think uh, one thing to consider. Uh, I I published an article in the Western Historical Quarterly some time some time ago, and have one coming out in Utah Historical Quarterly. Uh, Western Historical Quarterly has become very very selective, and I don't know what the selectivity rating of Journal of Mormon History is, but I'll bet it's lower than Western Historical Quarterly. And so I think that could be a factor. The different selectivity ratings of the different journals could affect where, where people are publishing. Uh, you're right, there are those other outlets, um, but I think Utah Historical Quarterly still maintains its reputation of entertaining a variety of views on, on, on Mormon history that, you, that maybe you won't find in BYU studies, for example. Mm -hmm. Or, or in dialogue. Yeah, and, and I should clarify that, you know, I don't, I have not, I have not considered my role as rejecting Mormon history per se. It's only just opening up the tent of Utah history or UHQ has, has opened the tent up, I think from the very beginning to include those stories that are not Mormon history. Um, now we can have a different conversation about, you know, the criteria that we have to, to decide, yeah. you know, what, what goes into the, to the journal, how editors make those choices, and uh, the peer review process and that sort of thing. But yeah. So if we, I just want to bounce this to Gary, who's, I've read some of your great articles in the quarterly. What if we were to look at it a different way and talk about, well, how much religious history is in the Utah Historical Quarterly? Because I, I do think, I, I don't know, I want, what do you think about that, Gary? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I've only written about one religion, and that is the Roman Catholic Church. So, and, uh, you know, we are a very, very small minority, and uh, I count myself very lucky to have been able to publish as much as I have in the quarterly. I, I, I feel like maybe what I've published has kind of overbalanced uh, the number of actual Catholics in the state. So maybe we've given more emphasis to Catholicism than it deserves. Uh, Holly and I have talked about that before, that it's really strange to be worried about publishing too much Catholic history in the Utah Historical Quarterly. So, so I don't know. Uh, that's about all I have to offer about that. Oh, I think... You know, we. I think we could have more religious history, and I like that that comment, Susan. And you know, um, I guess along the same lines, uh, Greg Waltz in the in the questions brings up the we don't have enough on the Korean War, Utahns and the Korean War, and I I think that's that is probably a hole that we could look at. Um. Yeah, I want to consider. Um. I, uh, a question that I have, and I guess it's a, a self, selfish question in a way, um, is, is I wanted to ask you all, um, it, you know, if Brigham Young, George Q. Cannon, Reed Smoot, the, the boys have, have had so much attention already, what, sh should we have criteria for publishing future articles about them? Is that too limiting? Um, Spencer, you're smiling. I, 
you know, I mean, there's no question that understanding the framework of Utah history, you're, you're going to talk about Reed Smoot and, and Brigham Young along, and they're, they're fascinating fellows. But what's the criteria? How much do we have to add to the bricks of knowledge? Does an article have to add to publish it? Is that something we should even be thinking about? You know, Holly, when you, uh, Holly, when you first posed that question, I was thinking back to my time in graduate school and my great uh, colonial prof, Larry Gerlach. And at one point in his seminar, he happened to mention that there were, at that time, this was in 1972, there were some 100 books in existence on the Battle of Trenton alone. Now, you talk about an overworked subject. We probably don't need any more books about the Battle of Trenton. And one might say, well, maybe we don't need anything more about Brigham Young and George Q. Cannon either. But boy, I would not want to close the door if I were in you or Jed's shoes and I got an article about Brigham Young and George, or George Q. Cannon, I would just say, look, I'm going to read this sucker. And if he's got something original to say, and based on some new sources or something like that, I'll publish it. You know, I, I, I'm just not willing to say that there's ever that the last word on any subject has ever been said. Of course, I would like to see people get away from the white Mormon hierarchy as well, you know, but as long as they have something good to say about it, I say, let them say it. That's wise. Well, I think this brings, brings up a bigger question of that you as the editors maybe could bring to to a conference. What is your role? Are you shaping the history? Or are you reflecting the history? And uh, should you? Is it is it a universal uh, good to increase re representation of minorities? I mean. Some people would say, some people would say no. I, you know, I I would say yes. But what what is your role? Uh, the the mere mention of Brigham Young shouldn't obviously disqualify an article. But you'll you'll know when you have an article evaluated if it's treading on ground that's already been worn. But I think that's a that's a bigger discussion that you ought to be thinking about. What what is your editorial policy? Is it just good work, or are you trying to actually shape the stream of Utah history? Yeah, I, I guess if I throw in my two cents, I think it's a different question entirely. If if the issue is should we publish another article about Brigham Young or publish an article about the LGBTQ community in, in Utah. I think that's a very different question versus like, should we, obviously we should be publishing good scholarship all around. Um, and so our, our intent isn't to say, you know, don't publish any more Brigham Young, but just, you know, to highlight that there's kind of these things going on. Yeah. Question, Spencer, and and, and I, I don't know, Jed, are articles about minority communities or articles about LGBTQ people in Utah, are they going somewhere else? I don't I don't know. Are there other outlets for them? And we'd li like to have them here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I, well, we know the editors of other journals and certainly they um, we maybe kick ourselves at like, oh, we did not we didn't receive that manuscript or we should have gone after that manuscript. Um, so yeah, these are this is fascinating. The 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 choices that we have as editors are are many, right? So if we had a choice between one or the other, I think it is useful to think about very, very carefully about which one we might we might choose. The way our process works, of course, is that most material that we publish is unsolicited manuscripts. Sometimes we need those manuscripts and we're gonna we're gonna be publishing something that meets our criteria regardless of the topic, sometimes we might have a choice. And in other cases, we have a, quite a bit of leverage and control by crafting special issues around certain topics. And there we can reach out specifically to folks who maybe have not been within the tent of UHQ's authorship to, to new voices and many, many times underrepresented voices and they're writing about fascinating topics that just have not shown up in UHQ in the past. But I, I would say as a general rule, I think that I do think that every generation writes its history. And it would be kind of an outdated notion to say, okay, all of the bricks have been laid or lain. 
for on Brigham Young. Um, in fact, you know, if, a, if an article on Brigham Young or Canton or Smoot meets our criteria, the guidelines and expectations of quality and builds on scholarship in real and lasting ways, I think that that would be something for us to consider. And I've, and I think there are plenty of examples of this. Our, let me just mention this because we just barely announced this. Our best book uh, this year is Sally in Three Worlds, which is about Sally Young and you know this um, Native American um, in the household of Brigham Young, and it really, really puts a different perspective and spin on on what life was like in in Brigham Young's household. There's an example of scholarship that is moving moving the literature forward in in real and useful ways, and Brigham Young features prominently in it. Yeah, I, I guess I need to add that I was being a little contrarian or something. <laughs> um, I, I don't really think we should have written down criteria about stuff. Um, I'm going to say it, re respond to some of the Q&A by saying, um, Elizabeth, could you type your comment in the, in the chat or the Q&A? And then um, I'm going to read something David Rich Lewis has written here. Um, he said, as former editor of the WHQ, a lot of the stats on gender and ethnic subject matter and author gender and also biases toward privileged white males that appear in UHQ are familiar probably to all editors and journals nationally. It's a great source of frustration. The scholarly turn in these subjects is well underway, but there's always a big lag in pipeline publication. Yes. As historiographic questions and fields continue ex to expand or shift and become more inclusive, we'll see these deficits decline as we've seen it decline in the last decade. Editors increasingly are spending a lot of their time encouraging and developing these new histories and authors, especially among students. Editors are of the, at the mercy of what comes in, but they also can and should be shaping the field. And I'd say that's something Jed and I have um, experienced is that you, you, um, are you're at the mercy of what comes in and yet you try to shape it and that's that's tricky <laughs> um yeah yeah so elizabeth if you don't mind talking or typing into the q a um and let me in the meantime ask another question um i've already asked about source work jed what do you want to ask the panel Well, I don't know, uh, Gary and Susan. I would I would love to hear your thoughts on the if you had anything additional to say about this connection between Western American history and Mormon uh, history. If there's interesting insights or connections that Spencer and Liza's analysis has has presented to you about those connections and relationships. One thing that struck me in relation to this was how uh, I think they said somewhere, and maybe you can help me with this, Spencer or Eliza, that those uh, articles that are cited uh, have a, a, a wider penumbra. They're they're more important in terms of being cited if they're couched in Western history. Can you help me understand exactly what you what you said there? Um, and I think that we have an opportunity for Utah history to have more impact if we place it within the wider regional framework. And to not do that misses an opportunity for us. Um, and, I, and I think it's good for uh, us people to submit history of the state of Utah to, to lots of different journals, not just the Utah Historical Quarterly. Uh, often that involves uh, becoming more familiar with a historiography that you're not as familiar with is sometimes it takes it takes more work but it's it's worthwhile work so if our goal is what what is what is the impact of utah or the importance of utah or the significance of utah to religious history or american history or western history then we have the chance to make a, a broader impact i i i'm just gonna give my amens to that know the broader history yeah 
Spencer, you were going to say something, please? Yeah, I, sorry, I missed your no, question no. that you were asking, Susan, that you were asking us to clarify. Susan, um, I, What in my notes, I just have the impact on theses and dissertation book published. Authors suggest that articles on non Mormon theme may have a wider scholarly impact. Does that help, Spencer? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is something that um, trying to figure out ways to quantify more specifically. But the general sense that we get when looking at it is there's cita the citation networks for articles that have a strong Mormon history theme, LDS history theme, tend to have a somewhat more, a somewhat smaller, but more consecrate, con concentrated network. So like Journal of Mormon History, Dialogue, um, John Whitmer Historical Association, um, BYU Studies, these, these sorts of journals. Um, its citation network tends to be a little bit smaller, but yeah, more concentrated, where uh, articles that are not explicitly about the Mormon or LDS experience in Utah, they tend to have a much bigger potential network, but that network also isn't very clear. It's not clear who is going to cite them, who is likely to cite them, but the potential reach is much broader. But who does anything with that or who who is going to make something of that is a little bit more open and unclear to to the idea that you know to make the case for bringing more interdisciplinary perspectives in the journal i think that we've seen that that's really worked for us um being um uh, adaptable to different types of formats maybe even shorter kind of essay like um, pieces that, um, and, and working with scholars in other fields to sort of understand our criteria as a history journal, I think has been really fruitful. We've had some great results in that in special issues that we've done. And I would, to I think echo what you had said, Susan, is sort of encourage historians to also venture out beyond their disciplinary boundaries to perhaps publish another. I mean, I, I want to take on that challenge myself. I think it's really useful to understand the perspectives from from various disciplines and that only that only broadens the perspective of that that we're representing in our history but i think it um yeah it it just it just widens everything everything out and i think it is important for us to think in terms of utah history quite broadly as as a as a in a regional approach um Beyond, of course, integrating new, new and underrepresented voices into the into the scholarship. You know, I think we need to uh, recognize, of course, that Utah has its uniqueness, uh, and of course, the presence of the Mormons here is probably the most conspicuously unique feature of, of Utah culture. But on the other hand, uh, we we need not uh, we dare not forget that Utah is not only a Western state; it is perhaps the quintessentially Western state. Um, on music and the spoken word, they used to refer to Salt Lake City as the crossroads of the West, and so we have this that's Chamber of Commerce fluffery and all of that, which it is. But but Salt Lake City is the crossroads of the West. And, uh, and we ought to uh, constantly write uh, Utah history with that in mind. Uh, just a suggestion, an, an earlier book that I might cite as just the, the greatest model for that kind of thing would be Dale Morgan's History of the Great Salt Lake. Uh, you know, he treats uh, uh, the Great Salt Lake just really as the crossroads of the West. You read in that page after page after page, and you see nothing about the lake itself. But what you see is this uh, trails across the territory, uh, north, south, east, and west, that that Utah was the place where uh, everybody wound up sooner or later. 
uh, on the Oregon Trail. They, were, they would often make a detour from Fort Bridger uh, down to Salt Lake City to resupply, get new animals, fix their wagons, whatever. So even though it wasn't on the Oregon Trail, it was a, an important part of the Oregon Trail. So uh, I'm sure you've all read Morgan's book on the Great Salt Lake, but I would just uh, suggest that when we want to talk about a larger context, that that's a role model we might want to keep in mind. That's fantastic, Gary. Um, I want well while we have time, I'm going to read Elizabeth Giroux's comment, and I, gosh, I wish I, you know, known this stuff <laughs> writing the dissertation. Um, but uh, it, it, this speaks to the sources and and the um, also thinking broadly. Elizabeth notes that there are a lot of public history sources that are overlooked by those writing for UHQ or similar publications. Um, so that UDOT were funding a post-war residential historic context. It'll have a 30-page bibliography that'll probably refer to Utah and the Korean War. That's one example. And then the CES, some <laughs> who knows what that stands for, of the research, Transportation Research Board is composed of transportation agency historians. Um, and at least two of them have discussed Latinx contexts in those states. That's a that's a great source recommendation. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, you know, say I guess those are the kind of leads you get talking to people. You get at the NCPH conference. Um, that's a really really good reminder to think broadly when doing your source work. Um, would anyone? We've got three minutes. Anyone like to make some closing comments? Maybe Spencer or Eliza on um to put you on the spot on, on what you see here or or places to go eliza do you have any thoughts <laughs> um i guess i'm thinking about who who do you want the journal to be for you know it, it's representation for representation's sake so what right but who are you hoping to read the journal and and why? What do you want them to get out of it? And I think that that needs to be a really um, central part of that mission when looking at expanding representation of, of you know, who, who is the reader? Who's the one who's going to, to get this history and what impact do you want it to have? That's very important. I think mean, that's great. I guess my final words would be thanks for allowing us to present and for the support for this project, Jed and Holly, over the last few months. Um, All right. Well, thank you, um, Susan, Gary, Spencer, Eliza, um, very, very much for joining us. Thanks for our audience. I really appreciate that. And I'm sorry I couldn't get to every every question, but. Um, has been very helpful and and Eliza I think you just hit the perfect note what 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 are we writing for what are we publishing for and to what end and to to keep that in mind so we'll have this re we have this recorded thank you this is a perfect um conclusion to our our series our lecture series on um the USHS on its 125th year so thank you all very much. Um, Jed, would you like to say anything in closing? Well, I guess I'd only, again, thank our presenters today and um, say that the full report and findings will be um, published in the winter issue of the Utah Historical Quarterly. So that is uh, really appreciative of all of the analysis that's been done and for sharing it with us and then for living on in the archive of the quarterly was which I think is great I think it will um I think it's going to have an Im I think it's going to have an impact I mean it's something to go back to useful for us as editors and I think it's useful for scholars to see um how the field has has evolved over the years and maybe find ways in which you can situate your work um, more broadly in that field and find those those people and places and dates um that have have not been represented as much in the journal so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and end this um, session. Thank you so much. Um, we'll talk to you all later. <laughs>